it's so good to see so many uh, old pals here tonight. The history of the Fountain Theater is sitting in our audience. It's a real joy to see so many of you. Uh, great occasion, obviously, but uh, Deb gifted so many of us with so much art and so much love. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I've been asked to read uh, a message. Um, which is titled, Seemingly Random But Wonderful Connections Between Gordon and Deborah. My name is Gordon Corstange, and I live in Vermont. When I arrived in Oroville, India in 1972, fresh from the Peace Corps, the legend of Deborah and Bob Lawler was already firmly established, even though they were no longer living in the international community. But they and a few others had been the first Western Oravillians to live on the Red Earth Plateau near Pondicherry in South India within sight of the Bay of Bengal. Their little group called their community Forecomers, and they built a house that rotated in order to catch the cool wind off the ocean. They put on a theatrical dance performance in an eroded canyon. They planted trees and grew local grains. They walked in the moonlit canyon. The magic aura of forecomers still lingered after Bob and Deborah were gone from their Eden, after Bob went off to do other things. When I came to teach in the Oroville School, I inherited the children of Bob and Deborah's forecomers watchmen, two boys who Deborah had sent to be educated. So I heard Bob and Deborah's story from a different perspective, that of the local Indian village near Forecomers where the boys lived. The oldest was named Dandapani. Many years later, Deborah and I met in Bennington, Vermont, and we talked about our shared interest in Indian bhakti poetry and music. She asked me to come to LA and be in her dance drama, The Path of Love as an actor and flute player. It was then I lived in her, in her house for three months and learned more about forecomers and also the fountain. I also learned that once she accepted and understood you, she was a tremendously generous person. I loved working at the fountain for that brief time. It was a wonderful vehicle for Deborah's artistic vision and experimentation. After several more years, I joined with her to bring Dandapani, now an adult, and his family to LA for, for the start of a tour of the USA. It was a joyful reunion. There may be some of you who remember when they came to the fountain. The family had never been out of India. Even now, when I go to their house in Oroville, they speak of it with reverence and enthusiastical memories. When Deborah began coming back to Oroville, she never failed to go to their house for a dinner reunion. That's my brief story of being a part of Deborah's full and rich life. The last time I met her was at a dinner party in Oroville, and we had a long and absorbing talk about the connections between us. Gordon Carstange. When I think of Deb, I think of her as this multifaceted gem. Just, I mean, she was this kind of person, you know, just when you think that you know who she is, she surprises you with yet another side to her. And I remember um, in 2003, I was upstairs uh, out on the deck and I was reading a play and by that point, uh, I had been here for um, about 10 years, almost 11 years, yeah, 10 years, 11 years. And I, I already knew most of the stories about Deb. I knew about, you know, her growing up in Riverside. I knew about her infamous career in New York. Uh, I knew about Oroville. I knew about the mother. I knew about her relationship with her ex-husband, Robert. Um, I knew about their adventures in France and in Egypt and the translations of uh, Egyptian 
esoterica, uh, and uh, of course I knew her uh, as the warm, wonderful human being that she was, uh, and um, as this beatific, really caring person. So I knew all these sides of Deb. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there reading the play, Deb comes out uh, onto the deck, uh, as she usually did with her cigarette uh, and her cup of coffee. And, um, and she sat across from me and I'm reading the play and she says, what are you reading? And I said, oh, I'm reading this play by a friend of mine. Her name is Lynn Kaufman and it's called Daisy in the Dreamtime. And it's about this, it's a true story. It's about this woman, Daisy Bates, who in 19, is this Irish woman, who in 1930 gets on a ship from Ireland and goes to Australia to live among the Aborigines and to enter the dream time. And um, Daisy Bates becomes this uh, foremost authority on Aborigines uh, in Australia. And Deborah gets that beatific smile, those of you who remember that beatific smile uh, on her face. And she gets this sort of faraway look and I, and I said, what's up, Deb? And she said, well, after Oroville, uh, Robert and I uh, went in search of another Oroville. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, we went to Australia. And in Australia, she toured around Australia. She met with a bunch of Aboriginal groups. Uh, and they were trying to find the right place. They ended up in Tasmania, eventually. And then, uh, off the coast of Tasmania, is a small island called Flinders Island. And they ended up on Flinders Island, and there they uh, met with and lived among uh, the, uh, the, the residents of Flinders Island, as well as uh, Aboriginal groups. And the goal was to create another Oroville. Uh, that didn't happen uh, because of uh, personal and uh, professional reasons. Uh, that, that never came to pass, and so they eventually went back to Oroville. Um, for the for a second time and so she, here she is telling me all these stories about her encounters with the Aborigines um, we eventually did the play the following year uh, at inside the Ford and um, Deb and I would spend uh, days outside uh, during the rehearsal process talking about uh, Aborigines and their belief system and the dream time. And she had this vast knowledge of this entire world, this, this entire group of people. And I would just sit there in awe of her that she had not only all the other knowledge that she had, but that she also had this knowledge as well. And then, of course, it influenced my approach to the play because I, I was directing the play. Uh, even to the, uh, to the extent that uh, we decided at Inside the Ford that we would bring in two tons of red earth 